Encyclopédie, O Dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des matières English, Encyclopédia, or a systematic dictionary of the sciences, arts, and crafts, better known as Encyclopédie, was a general encyclopedia published in France between 1751 and 1772, with later supplements, revised editions, and translations. It had many writers, known as the Encyclopédistes. It was edited by Denis Diderot and, until 1759, co-edited by Jean Le Ronde d'Alembert. The Encyclopédie is most famous for representing the thought of the Enlightenment. According to Denis Diderot in the article, Encyclopédie, the Encyclopédie's aim was to change the way people think, and for people to be able to inform themselves and to know things. He and the other contributors advocated for the secularization of learning away from the Jesuits. Diderot wanted to incorporate all of the world's knowledge into the encyclopedia and hoped that the text could disseminate all this information to the public and future generations. It was also the first encyclopedia to include contributions from many named contributors, and it was the first general encyclopedia to describe the mechanical arts. In the first publication, 17 folio volumes were accompanied by detailed engravings. Later volumes were published without the engravings, in order to better reach a wide audience within Europe. <inaudible> <inaudible> Origins The Encyclopédie was originally conceived as a French translation of Ephraim Chambers's Encyclopédia Ephraim Chambers had first published his Cyclopaedia, or an Universal Dictionary of Arts and Sciences in two volumes in London in 1728, following several dictionaries of arts and sciences that had emerged in Europe since the late 17th century. This work became quite renowned, and four editions were published between 1738 and 1742. An Italian translation appeared between 1747 and 1754. In France a member of the banking family Lambert had started translating Chambers into French, but in 1745 the expatriate Englishmen John Mills and German Gottfried Sellius were the first to actually prepare a French edition of Ephraim Chambers's Cyclopaedia for publication, which they entitled Encyclopédie. Early in 1745 a prospectus for the Encyclopédie was published to attract subscribers to the project. This four-page prospectus was illustrated by Jean-Michel Papillon, and accompanied by a plan, stating that the work would be published in five volumes from June 1746 until the end of 1748. The text was translated by Mills and Sellius, and it was corrected by an unnamed person, who appears to have been Denis Diderot. The prospectus was reviewed quite positively and cited at some length in several journals. The memoirs pour l'histoire des sciences et des beaux-arts journal was lavish in its praise. Voici de des plus fortes entreprises de littérature con eight fates depuis long temps. Here are two of the greatest efforts undertaken in literature in a very long time. The Mercure Journal in June 1745 printed a 25 page article that specifically praised Mill's role as translator. The journal introduced Mill's as an English scholar who had been raised in France and who spoke both French and English as a native. The journal reported that Mill's had discussed the work with several academics, was zealous about the project, had devoted his fortune to support this enterprise, and was the sole owner of the publishing privilege. However, the cooperation fell apart later on in 1745. André Le Breton, the publisher commissioned to manage the physical production and sales of the volumes, cheated Mills out of the subscription money, claiming for example that Mills's knowledge of French was inadequate. In a confrontation Le Breton physically assaulted Mills. Mills took Le Breton to court, but the court decided in Le Breton's favour. Mills returned to England soon after the court's ruling. For his new editor, Le Breton settled on the mathematician Jean-Paul de Guer de Malves. Among those hired by Malves were the young Etienne Bonnot de Condillac, Jean Le Ronde d'Alembert, and Denis Diderot. Within 13 months, in August 1747, Guer de Malves was fired for being an ineffective leader. Le Breton then hired Diderot and d'Alembert to be the new editors. Diderot would remain as editor for the next 25 years, seeing the Encyclopédie through to its completion. D'Alembert would leave this role in 1758. As D'Alembert worked on the Encyclopédie, its title expanded. 
As of 1750, the full title was Encyclopédie, au Dictionnaire raisonné des sciences, des arts et des matières, par une société de gens de lettres, mis en ordre par M. Diderot de l'Académie des sciences et belles lettres de Prusse, et quant à la partie mathématique, par M. d'Alembert de l'Académie royale des sciences de Paris, de celle de Prusse et de la Société royale de Londres, Encyclopédia, or a systematic dictionary of the sciences, arts, and crafts, by a company Company of Persons of Letters, edited by M. Diderot of the Academy of Sciences and Belles Lettres of Prussia, as to the mathematical portion, arranged by M. D'Alembert of the Royal Academy of Sciences of Paris, to the Academy of Sciences in Prussia and to the Royal Society of London, the title page was amended as D'Alembert acquired more titles. Topic. Publication The work consisted of 28 volumes, with 71,818 articles and 3,129 illustrations. The first 17 volumes were published between 1751 and 1765, 11 volumes of plates were finished by 1772. Engraver Robert Bainyard provided at least 1,800 plates for the work. Because of its occasional radical contents, see contents. Below, the Encyclopédie caused much controversy in conservative circles, and on the initiative of the Parliament of Paris, the French government suspended the Encyclopédie's privilege in 1759. Despite the suspension, work continued, in secret, partially because the project had highly placed supporters, such as Malechebis and Madame de Pompadour. The authorities deliberately ignored the continued work, they thought their official ban was sufficient to appease the church and other enemies of the project. During the secretive period, Diderot accomplished a well-known work of subterfuge. The title pages of volumes 1 through 7, published between 1751 and 1757, claimed Paris as the place of publication. However, the title pages of the subsequent text volumes, 8 through 17, published together in 1765, show Neufchastel as the place of publication. Neufchastel, now Neuchâtel, is safely across the French border in what is now part Switzerland but which was then an independent principality, where official production of the Encyclopédie was secure from interference by agents of the French state. In particular, regime opponents of the Encyclopédie could not seize the production plates for the Encyclopédie in Paris because those printing plates ostensibly existed only in Switzerland. Meanwhile, the actual production of volumes 8 through 17 quietly continued in Paris. In 1775, Charles Joseph Pankowker obtained the rights to reissue the work. He issued five volumes of supplementary material and a two-volume index from 1776 to 1780. Some scholars include these seven extra volumes as part of the first full issue of the Encyclopédie, for a total of 35 volumes, although they were not written or edited by the original authors. From 1782 to 1832, Pankowker and his successors published an expanded edition of the work in some 166 volumes as the Encyclopédie Methodique. That work, enormous for its time, occupied a thousand workers in production and 2,250 contributors. Topic: <laughs> Contributors. Since the objective of the editors of the Encyclopédie was to gather all the knowledge in the world, Diderot and D'Alembert knew they would need various contributors to help them with their project. Many of the philosophies intellectuals of the French Enlightenment contributed to the Encyclopédie, including Diderot himself, Voltaire, Rousseau, and Montesquieu. The most prolific contributor was Louis de Jaucourt, who wrote 17,266 articles between 1759 and 1765, or about eight per day, representing a full 25% of the encyclopédie. The publication became a place where these contributors could share their ideas and interests. Still, as Frank Kafka has argued, the encyclopedists were not a unified group, Despite their reputation, the encyclopedists were not a close-knit group of radicals intent on subverting the old regime in France. Instead they were a disparate group of men of letters, physicians, scientists, craftsmen and scholars. 
even the small minority who were persecuted for writing articles belittling what they viewed as unreasonable customs, thus weakening the might of the Catholic Church and undermining that of the monarchy, did not envision that their ideas would encourage a revolution. Following is a list of notable contributors with their area of contribution for a more detailed list, see Encyclopedistes. Jean Le Ronde d'Alembert, editor, science, especially mathematics, contemporary affairs, philosophy, religion, among others. Claude Bourgelat, Manegay, Farrieri. André Le Breton, chief publisher, article on Printers Inc. Louis Jean Marie Daubenton, Natural History. Denis Diderot, chief editor, economics, mechanical arts, philosophy, politics, religion, among others. Baron Dolbach, science, chemistry, mineralogy, politics, religion, among others. Chevalier Louis de Jaucourt, economics, literature, medicine, politics, bookbinding, among others. Jean Baptiste de la Chapelle, mathematics. Abbe Andre Morellet, theology, philosophy. Montesquieu, part of the article. Gout. Taste. Francois Quesnay, articles on tax farmers and grain. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Music, Political Theory Anne-Robert Jacques Turgot, Baron de Lorne, Economics, Etymology, Philosophy, Physics Voltaire, History, Literature, Philosophy Due to the controversial nature of some of the articles, several of its editors went to jail. Topic. Contents and controversies Topic. Structure Like most encyclopedias, the encyclopedia attempted to collect and summarize human knowledge in a variety of fields and topics, ranging from philosophy to theology to science and the arts. The encyclopedia was controversial for reorganizing knowledge based on human reason instead of by nature or theology. Knowledge and intellect branched from the three categories of human thought, whereas all other perceived aspects of knowledge, including theology, were simply branches or components of these man-made categories. The introduction to the Encyclopédie, d'Alembert's preliminary discourse, is considered an important exposition of Enlightenment ideals. Among other things, it presents a taxonomy of human knowledge see Fig. 3, which was inspired by Francis Bacon's The Advancement of Learning. The three main branches of knowledge are memory, history, reason, philosophy, and imagination, poetry. This tree of knowledge was created to help readers evaluate the usefulness of the content within the encyclopedia, and to organize its content. Notable is the fact that theology is ordered under philosophy, and that knowledge of God is only a few nodes away from divination and black magic. Topic. Religious and political controversies The authors of the Encyclopédie challenged religious authority. The authors, especially Diderot and D'Alembert, located religion within a system of reason and philosophy. They did not reject all religious claims, but believed theology and notions of God must be proven. Louis de Jaucourt therefore harshly criticized superstition as an intellectual error in his article on the topic. The writers emphasized an individual's right to religious sovereignty. They therefore doubted the authenticity of presupposed historical events cited in the Bible and questioned the validity of miracles and the resurrection. However, some contemporary scholars argue the skeptical view of miracles in the encyclopedia may be interpreted in terms of Protestant debates about the cessation of the charismata. The writers emphasized an individual's right to religious sovereignty. These challenges led to suppression from church and state authorities. The encyclopedia and its contributors endured many attacks and attempts at censorship by the clergy or other censors, which threatened the publication of the project as well as the authors themselves. The King's Council suppressed the encyclopedia in 1759. The Catholic Church, under Pope Clement XIII, placed it on its list of banned books. Prominent intellectuals criticized it, most famously Le Franc de Pompignon at the French Academy. A playwright, Charles Pallas at de Montenoy, wrote a play called Les Philosophies to criticize the Encyclopédie. 
When Abbé André Morellet, one of the contributors to the Encyclopédie, wrote a mock preface for it, he was sent to the Bastille due to allegations of libel, to defend themselves from controversy. The Encyclopédia's articles wrote of theological topics in a mixed manner. Some articles supported orthodoxy, and some included overt criticisms of Christianity. To avoid direct retribution from censors, writers often hid criticism in obscure articles or expressed it in ironic terms. Nonetheless, the contributors still openly attacked the Catholic Church in certain articles with examples including criticizing excess festivals, monasteries, and celibacy of the clergy. Topic: <laughs> Politics and Society. The Encyclopédie is often seen as an influence for the French Revolution because of its emphasis on enlightenment political theories. Diderot and other authors, in famous articles such as Political Authority, emphasized the shift of the origin of political authority from divinity or heritage to the people. This Enlightenment ideal, espoused by Rousseau and others, advocated that people have the right to consent to their government in a form of social contract. Another major, contentious component of political issues in the Encyclopédie was personal or natural rights. Articles such as Natural Rights by Diderot explained the relationship between individuals and the general will. The natural state of humanity, according to the authors, is barbaric and unorganized. To balance the desires of individuals and the needs of the general will, humanity requires civil society and laws that benefit all persons. Writers, to varying degrees, criticized Thomas Hobbes' notions of a selfish humanity that requires a sovereign to rule over it. In terms of economics, the Encyclopédie expressed favor for laissez faire ideals or principles of economic liberalism. Articles concerning economics or markets, such as economic politics, generally favored free competition and denounced monopolies. Articles often criticized guilds as creating monopolies and approved of state intervention to remove such monopolies. The writers advocated extending laissez-faire principles of liberalism from the market to the individual level, such as with privatization of education and opening of careers to all levels of wealth. Topic: <laughs> Science and Technology. At the same time, the Encyclopédie was a vast compendium of knowledge, notably on the technologies of the period, describing the traditional craft tools and processes. Much information was taken from the descriptions des arts et matières. These articles applied a scientific approach to understanding the mechanical and production processes, and offered new ways to improve machines to make them more efficient. Diderot felt that people should have access to useful knowledge that they can apply to their everyday life. Topic. Influence The Encyclopédie played an important role in the intellectual ferment leading to the French Revolution. No encyclopedia perhaps has been of such political importance, or has occupied so conspicuous a place in the civil and literary history of its century. It sought not only to give information, but to guide opinion," wrote the 1911 Encyclopædia Britannica. In the Encyclopédie and the Age of Revolution, a work published in conjunction with a 1989 exhibition of the Encyclopédie at the University of California, Los Angeles, Clorinda Donato writes the following. The Encyclopedians successfully argued and marketed the belief in the potential of reason and unified knowledge to empower human will and thus help to shape the social issues that the French Revolution would address. Although it is doubtful whether the many artisans, technicians, or laborers whose work and presence and interspersed throughout the Encyclopédie actually read it, the recognition of their work as equal to that of intellectuals, clerics, and rulers prepared the terrain for demands for increased representation. Thus the Encyclopédie served to recognize and galvanize a new power base, ultimately contributing to the destruction of old values and the creation of new ones. 12. While many contributors to the Encyclopédie had no interest in radically reforming French society, the Encyclopédie as a whole pointed that way. The Encyclopédie denied that the teachings of the Catholic Church could be treated as authoritative in matters of science. The editors also refused to treat the decisions of political powers as definitive in intellectual or artistic questions. 
Some articles talked about changing social and political institutions that would improve their society for everyone. Given that Paris was the intellectual capital of Europe at the time and that many European leaders used French as their administrative language, these ideas had the capacity to spread. The Encyclopédie's influence continues today. Historian Dan O'Sullivan compares it to Wikipedia. Like Wikipedia, the Encyclopédie was a collaborative effort involving numerous writers and technicians. As do Wikipedians today, Diderot and his colleagues needed to engage with the latest technology in dealing with the problems of designing an up-to-date encyclopedia. These included what kind of information to include, how to set up links between various articles, and how to achieve the maximum readership. Topic. Statistics Approximate size of the Encyclopédie 17 volumes of articles, issued from 1751 to 1765 11 volumes of illustrations, issued from 1762 to 1772 18,000 pages of text 75,000 entries 44,000 main articles 28,000 secondary articles 2,500 illustration indices 20 million words in total print run, 4,250 copies Note, even single volume works in the 18th century seldom had a print run of more than 1,500 copies. Topic quotations The goal of an encyclopedia is to assemble all the knowledge scattered on the surface of the earth, to demonstrate the general system to the people with whom we live, and to transmit it to the people who will come after us, so that the works of centuries past is not useless to the centuries which follow, that our descendants, by becoming more learned, may become more virtuous and happier, and that we do not die without having merited being part of the human race. Encyclopedia, Diderot, reason is to the philosopher what grace is to the Christian. Other men walk in darkness, the philosopher, who has the same passions, acts only after reflection, he walks through the night, but it is preceded by a torch. The philosopher forms his principles on an infinity of particular observations. He does not confuse truth with plausibility, he takes for truth what is true, for forgery what is false, for doubtful what is doubtful, and probable what is probable. The philosophical spirit is thus a spirit of observation and accuracy. Philosophers, Dumas say, if exclusive privileges were not granted, and if the financial system would not tend to concentrate wealth, there would be few great fortunes and no quick wealth. When the means of growing rich is divided between a greater number of citizens, wealth will also be more evenly distributed. Extreme poverty and extreme wealth would be also rare. Wealth, Diderot, Aguiximer, a plant growing in Brazil and on the islands of South America. This is all that we are told about it, and I would like to know for whom such descriptions are made. It cannot be for the natives of the countries concerned, who are likely to know more about the Aguiximer than is contained in this description, and who do not need to learn that the Aguiximer grows in their country. It is as if you said to a Frenchman that the pear tree is a tree that grows in France, in Germany, etc. It is not meant for us either, for what do we care that there is a tree in Brazil named Aguiximer, if all we know about it is its name? What is the point of giving the name? It leaves the ignorant just as they were and teaches the rest of us nothing. If all the same I mention this plant here, along with several others that are described just as poorly, then it is out of consideration for certain readers who prefer to find nothing in a dictionary article or even to find something stupid than to find no article at all. Aguixima, Diderot Topic. Facsimiles. Redex Microprint Corporation, NY 1969. Five volume the full text and images reduced to four double spread pages of the original appearing on one folio sized page of this printing. Later released by the Pergamon Press, NY and Paris with ISBN 0 08 0901050.